it is that time of the year folks finally after a delay of one year euro 2020 is upon us i know i know it's 2021 but it is still called euro 2020 for both sets let's see for our fans and for analysts we'll use both euro 2020 and euro 2021 at very convenient instances it is the day where we preview champions france portugal croatia technically not champions but that golden generation are definitely a bunch of champions i am siddharth vishwanathan editor in chief of sportslumo.com and i am joined by shane dyer senior editor of sportslumo.com we are going to preview three mega teams today portugal france croatia france the reigning world cup champions 2018 what a dominant display that was from the french portugal are the reigning euro champions four years back five years back but yes still a contender thanks mainly to one mega star called cristiano ronaldo croatia not champions but that golden generation really really put on a fabulous show and they bet- better their previous performance of 1998 when they reached the semi finals on debut so shane let us first preview france the the star power that they have got i remember in 2018 a teenager who has the world at his feet he wears the number 10 jersey the number 10 is considered a legends jersey but kylian mbappe the force that he was in 2018 is he the force even now in 2021 i would argue he's gotten better because i mean the whole point of being that young when he was about 19 20 years old in 2018 he's developed a lot as a player and he the thing with him is he knows just how good he is which makes it very dangerous in his mind because it's not just the fact that he can dominate he knows exactly how much he can dominate and he's already done it not just i mean his peers the peers decide with featuring him and neymar have been dominating french football for a while but now uh, it's it worth remembering that that same team reached the finals of the champions league in 2020 and this is a player who has won a world cup i wouldn't say single handedly but i think i think it's fair to say that france benefited a lot from having him around and he's only grown in stature and you know fitness assuming he's going to have uh, someone like karim benzema partnering him up from this time around why is the fitness assuming is because in france was last a uh, friendly match uh, benzema actually ended up walking off with what looked like an injury his status is still unclear but it's hard to look beyond how good france are even without him let's not forget france won the 2018 world cup with olivier giroud up front and giroud is now i think of just a few goals away from becoming france's all time top goal scorer i mean he's not a benzema like striker but that man deserves his due and if he's playing could very well be the difference between france and pretty much any other side Let's not also forget that Euro 2016, when Portugal won the tournament, they beat France in the final, and arguably, I would argue that that loss in the final was what motivated them to do as well as they did a few years later in the World Cup. Indeed, it motivated them well, and how well? I mean, look at the star power that they've got. In addition to Mbappe, you've got Paul Pogba, you've got Samuel Umtiti, you've got Antoine Griezmann for crying out loud. You also have Giroud, but then. the addition of benzema i mean 5 years later karim benzema comes back of course he was left out due to con- in controversial circumstances but the addition of benzema and jiru plus you have pavard in the ranks oh is there any weakness in the french team when you look at it i would say that there really is no weakness at this point i think the one major could be how uh, umtiti's fitness is because i think his previous few years and Barca have been fairly fairly uh, like he suffered with injuries the same of course could be said of Ousmane Dembele and since we're talking star players let's let's just not forget a certain Angolo Kanté who's going to be oh, running yeah. the show for France this fully fit so i mean with, with that midfield facing someone like Kanté Pogba you have forwards with the lines of Griezmann Benzema Fred Giroud for sure Mbappe Dembele it, it's hard yeah. to pick a weakness in that side It's very very hard. Same was true in 2018 when I think to very few people surprised they ended up going on to win. And there and that team has arguably only grown since then because the likes of Griezmann, Mbappe are now in their prime years, their peak years, and they're performing at a high level. Even Griezmann, people 
uh, like I think his last few years of club level have been a struggle at Barca. This season, he actually did manage to find his rhythm, and he was playing very, very well. He was dovetailing with Messi. He was getting on, uh, getting in the goal. So I think if you know if they find a position, I think the biggest headache which the, their manager has is finding a system that would operate best for them. Because you can say that he did it in 2018 as well. But I mean, yeah, there's definitely going to be a new challenge this time, and I think, but that's a good problem to have. Any manager would be happy with the problem of plenty. It's a problem of not having enough talent that what keeps and gives managers weak. Right. So to sum it up, no, I don't see a weakness in this side. I mean, we have even if you look at the keepers, we are assured that even Manuel Neuer is the wall. He will not allow easy goals to happen. But what about Hugo Lloris? Lloris also, apart from that one uh, misjudgment that he had in the final, he was very good even in the 2018 World Cup. So Lloris has also been in fine form in the league seasons. So what do you think about Lloris's contribution when you look at it in this French team? Absolutely key because it's, it's worth remembering that Lloris is also captain at uh, club and if I'm not wrong, international level as well. He's someone who knows how to lead the side, and I think the thing with Lloris is it's not just the issue of him being born into what is arguably a golden generation of people, but his lack of glory with uh, Tottenham Hotspur. Really, kind of keeps him out of the conversation for the best ever. Because I think, arguably, if you even look at world football right now, it's hard to make a top five or top ten list without keeping Lloris in there. The only problem is that he's probably not one. He's not one really won anything of note club level. So that kind of keeps him out of the conversation. But if you have to judge him on an individual basis, definitely a top class goalkeeper and very, very, very important to France. As he had proved in 2018 as well, and that's going to continue being the case because he's not really declined in any major way as such. So I mean, while Spain, you could argue, have a problem with the hair, with Lloris, sure he has an error or two in him, but those errors normally come from a high risk game, which is acceptable because I mean you're playing a high risk game, so sometimes there's going to be potential that little error to second, but it's also high reward. So yes, definitely he's going to be key for them, and France will hope that he does maintain his fitness this time. Oh, I mean, France, they are a team of superstars, hardly any weakness. But folks, you have to remember, they are in the group of death. France, Germany, Portugal and Hungary. You have to feel pity for the Hungarians, but let's not count them out. They can do a Greece 2004 also, but that'll be for some other time. But let us now shift from the 2018 World Cup winners to the 2016 Euro champions, Portugal. When you talk about the Portuguese football team, there is only one name that stands out. That's a certain Cristiano Ronaldo. A megastar is a very short word for Cristiano Ronaldo. But let me just rile up this entire Ronaldo versus Lionel Messi debate for all those fans out there. Messi has not won anything substantial for Argentina in his playing time. He has been on the receiving end of the Copa America finals twice, unfortunately. But with Ronaldo, he won Euro 2016. The emotion that came out, it meant how much Ronaldo wanted to do well for Portugal at the international level. So, tilting the GOAT debate, does Ronaldo have a slight edge over Messi, primarily because he won Euro 2016? I mean, look, it's, it's an interesting way to look at it and I certainly wouldn't begrudge anyone who feels that way. Of course, before I go any further, I have to add a little bit of bias here, Lionel Messi fans. No hate for Cristiano, I just prefer Messi, that's just her personal person. So, if you want to attack me in the comments, go for it, but I'm not responding. Just say. Anyway, back to the debate at hand. I mean, for one, it's a very hard debate to call and this is one which I... Oh, for years of supporting Messi, I've now come to the conclusion that there's no right or wrong answer here. I think football fans as a whole were very lucky to have two players of that stature, that superhuman stature, be playing in more or less the same generation. I mean, previously when you talked about uh, the GOAT, the greatest of all time, the two names which unequivocally came up were Pele and Maradona. The sad part for most fans of them is that they played in different generations. Maradona was on the up and come just as Pele's career was on the down. With Ronaldo and Messi, on the other hand, they've played, their careers have intertwined more or less. I mean, sure, Ronaldo started his career slightly earlier. And Messi's ascendancy started much later because he was a youth player at Barcelona. No mean feat. But their careers have more or less also taken off to the stratosphere at around the same time. But, I mean, having coming back to that and having 
made my allegiance. There's two major points to make here. One, I would argue that with regards to Ronaldo, of course, he's a key to Portugal. But I think one of the key players who's often overlooked thanks to Ronaldo's superstar stature was Bernardo Silva. And I feel bad for the guy at some level because he was not only top-notch for Portugal, but he had some top-notch city as well. And unfortunately, he gets overlooked just a tad because of the presence of a certain Kevin De Bruyne at club level. I mean, Bernardo is a very good player. He can slot into a multitude of positions. He can play deeper in midfield. He can play on the wings. He can play behind the striker. He's effective in a multitude of positions. And he's going to be key to them this time around as well. However, that being said, yes, it's definitely a big plus for Ronaldo that he's managed international glory with Portugal, whilst Messi, for heartbreaking reasons, is not. However, again, caveat here is that in 2014, when Argentina made the final, I would argue that they were dragged there kicking and screaming by Messi. Because that team, while it's been good, had maybe three or four players who they could focus on with regards to taking them to the next level. Lionel Messi was one of them. The criminally underrated Angel Di Maria was probably the other. And I still, I still feel just a little bit angry at Gonzalo Higuain for his display in that final. Because he missed three sitters and he even scored one where he was miles offside and then caught it off celebrating like God only knows what. But anyway, again, you have Iguain finish goals slightly better than the day. We could be talking Leo Messi world champion. As it stands, I don't think that's something that we're ever going to see either for Messi or Ronaldo. So I think it would be interesting to keep an eye out for the Copa America of 2020 this year. Because again, how Argentina fare is definitely going to be one of the big talking points. That being said, yes, you could see how much it meant to Ronaldo to actually win the Euros. And it's worth remembering that he was part of the 20, 2004 heartbreak when uh, Portugal lost that uh, World Cup to Greece, uh, the World Cup, sorry, the Euros to Greece. And that was in Portugal, so it was very heartbreaking for them in a way. But, uh, and, and you must remember, that Portugal side had like Luis Figo in there. Oh, well. yeah. It was very tough. They definitely faced it. But even then, I think it was a definite relief to him and that's because for all the club glory that you can have, it's, there's nothing quite like winning a trophy for your country. And the thing with Ronaldo, you have to realize why he's going to be so dangerous now is because he's just at one. Zero bit of mentality, he's going to want to do it again. And he is in good goal-scoring form. I mean, Juventus have had a fairly mixed season, but he's showing that he can still deliver the goods with me. So, Absolutely. Definitely, definitely Portugal are going to be one to watch. Also. Yes, I think let's not uh, add salt to the wounds of the 2014 final. I mean, Higuain, criminal. That miss that he had was criminal. Palacio missed one goal, if I am not mistaken in that. And yes, that offside celebration did not look good even on the big screen at that time. Yes. <laughs> so yes, Argentina do have problems. I mean, they had Sergio Aguero even now. Kun Aguero even now, but well, that's for another debate altogether when we focus on the Copa America. But, 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 there is a slight cloud over Cristiano Ronaldo because in the Portugal was a Spain match. Spain's captain Sergio Busquets tested positive for the coronavirus and he apparently had Cristiano Ronaldo. Now, we must all remember, Ronaldo tested positive last year. That is why we missed that mouth-watering UEFA Champions League clash between Juventus and Barcelona. And yes, we uh, Shane is right in, in a way that we are seeing a golden generation of players in multiple sports play together and exhibiting their magic. I mean, let's not, if you just go beyond football, look at tennis. Federer, Nadal, Djokovic. That trio... Yeah, I think Murray was unlucky to be born into this generation because yeah. if he was not, he would probably be at least a 7-8 time Grand Slam champion. And I think then... You know, he's indeed. very unlucky in that. Indeed, but. indeed. The likes of Stan Wawrinka, the likes of uh, Andy Murray, incredibly unlucky to have been swept away by the tsunami called Federer, Nadal, Djokovic. But that's a tennis debate. But again, if no Cristiano Ronaldo, because of pos possibility that he may have again contracted COVID, then do you think Bernardo Silva and Pepe hold the reins for Portugal and ensure that they are solid? Or do you think uh, their front line is totally compromised now? The thing is that their front line is very solid. Pepe will be slotting in just fine in defence and him and Ruben Diaz would be a very killer combination in defence. Which in pretty much ensures their defensive solidity. That being said, um, I mean, if you're missing Ronaldo, it's always a big blow. There's no two ways about it. The good news is he did play in their latest friendly match against Israel and 4-2. So, I don't think he's necessarily compromised. 
but in a rare case that something maybe props up later maybe he picks up a bit of a nickel or maybe it turns out that he was indeed exposed and has contracted a mild version of it portugal have a problem of plenty up front i mean personally i i think that the midfield lineup and forward lineup the uh, the uh, how it will consist of who it will consist of it's a very interesting call and there's no real wrong answer because even if you remove ronaldo you have the likes of andre silva who's done very well for eintracht frankfurt you have yao felix who as who's young very young and has just won the la liga with atletico madrid so i mean and i don't think yao felix is going to be starting that's the thing that's the kind of talent they have because he's most likely not going to be a starter because you're going to have ronaldo bruno uh, bruno fernandes has been spectacular for manchester united so you'd have bruno you'd have ronaldo silva so even missing ronaldo I mean, it's obviously a headache missing someone of this caliber, but they'll manage just fine because there is, thankfully, a good degree of talent in the Portuguese side, and most importantly, there's a winning mentality which exists in all of them. So that's always positive. So when we talk about Portugal, Shane, do they have the capability to repeat 2016, or because do you think they are in the group of death, their chances are a bit difficult this time around? They are a little bit difficult. I mean, I think anyone would have preferred not being in this group. Such is the quality of it. But uh, remember that uh, you can finish third place and still technically qualify for the knockout. And then once it's in the knockout, then and and this has always been my opinion that knockout football is a little bit of a lottery. I mean, you can be the better team, but are you the better team on the day? So and Portugal have shown that they know how to upset the odds because they were not favourites for Euro 2016. I think that would have been France, but they did very very well. In fact, Euro 2016 for me personally was the tournament of the underdog because if you don't look at just Portugal, I mean, you remember what a good run Wales had. You remember how well Iceland did. Oh yes. So I, I won't put it past I won't put it past anyone going on a similar run. And considering the minor teams are doing so well, I, it's very unwise to count on Portugal because even a third place finish could see them go through. Once they are in the knockout, then well, they have players who have enough experience for playing in those games. So impossible to discount them. Yeah, Euro 2016, obviously, yes, Portugal upset the odds, bet France. But I would slightly like to disagree with Shane for the underdog aspect because Euro 2004, Greece. I mean uh-huh. Greece upsetting the likes of every team France Portugal it was as if Portugal uh, twice yeah Portugal twice by the same margin as it was 1-0 and yes. it's like Japan or Argentina beating the All Blacks in the rugby final it would be that huge when it comes to magnitude so I would look at 2004 being the ultimate year of the underdog but yes even Portugal were not fancied because the likes of Spain Germany France were all good and they were consistent but now let us just switch to this one country that has match winners galore a population of just 4 million it might not even be 1/10th of delhi but look at the match winners that they have got i mean in 2018 i predominantly remember those guys because of everybody's display in that their fitness their consistency was simply unbelievable i mean These names will give everybody a clue. Luka Modric, Ivan Rakitic, Perisic, Mario Mandzukic, Subasic. I am talking about Croatia. Yet again, fancied under the cheers, but big time strides they have made in football. I mean, 2018 was the beginning of something big for Croatia. They are in a tough group. They will face England in one of the league games. A repeat of the 2018 World Cup semi-final, which. Unfortunately, England squandered a good position. I mean, Trippier when he got that goal, we all thought, "Wow, England might make." But yes, it. it really is coming home. <laughs> yes, indeed, after 50 odd years. But unfortunately, Mansukic stole the show, and I would say, was it Kremer? You know, Kremer scored against Russia. So this team, the core of 2018 is still there. Do you see Croatia going the distance in Euro 2020? It would be again. It would be very hard to bet against them. I mean, sure, they're missing a couple of players. Like you mentioned, you mentioned Rakitic and Mandzukic. Neither are actually available this time around. Yeah. But even besides that, if you look at their forwards, they have the likes of uh, Andre Kramaric. They have uh, Bruno Petkovic. They have Ante Rebic, who's done very, very well against yeah. Milan. So there are plenty of players, and they're midfield. I think they are stacked in midfield. So obviously, you have uh, Modric who's going to be running the show. You have Marcelo Brozovic, who's just coming off the Serie A win with Milan. 
you have uh, the likes of Perisic who's going to be uh, playing on the wings again and of course another name which i must mention is Mislav Orsic who Tottenham Hotspur fans will hate me for mentioning because that Zagreb man ended up scoring a hat-trick against them in the Europa League and knocking yeah. them out of a match which they should have probably won They also have uh, Matteo Kovacic, who's not a guaranteed starter, but the Chelsea guy is just coming off winning the Champions Trophy, Champions League, sorry, and he can play in a multitude of midfield positions. Always very useful. I think for Croatia, it's very very hard to you know rule them out in any way because let's not forget this is the core of the same team that came this close, the international glory, this close. They're not if they make it that far again, they are not going to want to let it slip a second time because that would be too hard for them and. This is also a team that has players who know how to win stuff. Let's not forget the likes of Modric and Kovacic are multiple-time Champions League winners, yeah. and the likes of Perisic again. Perisic coming off a Serie A with Inter, so these are players who know how to win. Now, just the key for them will be can they do it together? And it will be very hard to discuss them in that case. Indeed, but then I read somewhere that when Real Madrid were undergoing a slump, Modric was targeted because of his age factor. Do you think Luka Modric is the same force that he was in 2018 as compared to 2021 or do you think age has really caught up with Modric? Hey, I mean father time is such a thing that it waits for no one. So no matter how fit you stay, no matter how hard you work at your game, there are going to be things which over age, you know, do kind of catch up. And sure with uh, Modric as was pretty evident during the Champions League semi-final against Chelsea, he has lost a few yards of pace. However, the key thing is that ability, the ability to read the game, the ability to pick passes, the ability to know when to press, when to drop deep, that still remains. And that's the key with a lot of players who don't necessarily depend on their physicality in their game. I think another good example would be Modric's Real Madrid teammate Toni Kroos. Even when he was a 20-year-old, he wasn't going to be setting records for 100 meters sprint. But his game revolved around knowing which pass to pick. and which is why even now at this age and with his physicality declining a bit he's still a key player in Serie A because what he was good at is something that didn't depend on his body as such it was more the mind that saved him that it's the same with Modric to a large degree i mean he's still Croatia captain he's still when fit going to be starting every single game possible so i would not rule him out and he himself would be desperate because he's won everything possible when it comes to his club Yeah. It's just that one trophy with Croatia is needed. They came this close to a World Cup. If they can win the Euros, it's still a very, very good thing for this Croatia generation. Especially considering their previous status in international football as being nearly men at best and not qualifying as well. Indeed, indeed. I mean, yes, that final was really heartbreaking. Had it not been for that own goal, had it not been the handball, things would have been totally different. I mean, you exclude the two goals of. Pogba and Mbappe, which were class in its way, a two-two scorela in a final yet again going into penalties, a repeat of 2006. Who knows what would have happened? But unfortunate, yes. Like how Iceland were the darlings of the 2016 Euro, you did egg Croatia on to win because we needed a new winner apart from the usual triumvirate of France, uh, Spain, Italy, Brazil. I may say the quartet, if I may add. But Croatia, unfortunately. they are also in a tough group croatia england are in one group so they will go through to the next round there are no expectations but we are heading close to the first game of euro 2020 italy versus turkey now may not be much of a big deal for italy but again turkey shane what do you think uh, turkey are the uh, proverbial dark horses for this euro 2020 i mean they can cause an upset but they may not go the distance maybe Yeah, definitely for sure because they do have some fairly good players in their hands, and perhaps more importantly, internationally speaking, they have this ability of causing the odd upset. I mean, let's not forget how well they did. I mean, if you have to cast your mind back to the past and go to how well they did in the 2002 World Cup, yeah. where I would argue that they were unlucky to be knocked out thanks largely to some play acting from Rivaldo. Uh, no uh, one will uh, forget uh, that. Yes, yes. No yes. one will ever forget that. Yes, yes. So absolutely. they were a very good team even back then. and even now they do have some quality players so they have the likes of uh, uh, hakan chalanoglu who's done very well for ac milan someone who's very good at dead ball someone who's very good at play making so he would definitely be key as far as defense they have the likes of demiral who plays with juventus they have chagla soyuncu who's just coming off an epic up from the leicester they have ozan kabak who was on loan to liverpool this year 
so there's definitely some quality there and i mean let's not forget burak yilmaz who i think was part of the most fairy tale run this year at league where they ended up breaking psg's monopoly on liga and the thing with burak yilmaz is i think the year he was always considered someone who would be a bit of a football cult hero someone who scored plenty of goals but because he did them in turkey people didn't really pay much attention to it now the guy has gone and won a league with france and in france and not just that he's done it with a team that was not exactly the most fancy Lille's last Liga came in 2010-11, which wow. is when they had a golden trio of the likes of uh, Jovinho, who Arsenal fans would not so fondly remember, but who did very well at Lille. They also had a certain Eden Hazard, who was up on the prime at that point. Yeah. So, I mean, this is pre-Chelsea, but he was still very, very good in France. So, there's definitely plenty to look forward to with Turkey, but I think the team to watch out for in that game would definitely be Italy. This is a team that have not lost an international game since 2018. So under Mancini, they have been wonderful. There's been a real revival considering they didn't make it to the 2016 Euros and they didn't make it to the 2018 World Cup. Possibly the biggest heartbreak that you can imagine for Italian football and Italian football fans. And they've been revived. They look a very different unit, and it would be hard to even count out like them. Uh, Turkey might be able to cause an upset, but Italy are definitely going to be favourites going into that match. Indeed. Definitely going to be one to watch. Indeed, I mean, maybe in the history of Italian football, they may want to whitewash the years 2016 till 2018 because it was a darkest period in Italian football. Not qualifying for Euro may have been a slight body blow to them, maybe, but not qualifying for the World Cup would have shaken the very foundations of Italian football. I mean, look at it. Buffon could not have gone out on a high, unfortunately, because of what happened. But in 2018 in that match against sweden everybody's eyes was focused just on buffon and the quality that he has always given italy i mean these guys are all eternal superstars i mean you look at roberto baggio the way how he went out the emotions were so high in italy that was i mean 1994 was i know that would have been the crescendo for baggio but unfortunately didn't make it italy italy has always had this tragedy that has accompanied them You didn't expect them to win in 2006, but they did with some sublime football. From I guess their current uh, Juventus manager really set up well for them, right? Pirlo, Andre the Pirlo, the current former Juventus manager. Yeah, the yeah. current former Juventus manager. But because that 2006 final, I remember Pirlo was at his absolute best. Are you talking about tragedy? The 2006 World Cup came a year after what's referred to as the Calcio Poli scandal. and that was a big deal so italian football has always had a history of uh, to some degree match fixing yes. so the calcio poli scandal for those of you who for viewers who wouldn't be familiar with it was a scandal that caught up with the three biggest clubs in italy so not just any clubs here or there but there was big talk about referees supposedly being forced to give favorable decisions to the likes of juventus ac milan due to that both clubs actually ended up getting relegated from Uh, Serie A for a whole year. They were relegated. They were sent to the second division, and Juventus was stripped of two titles during that time period. So it's safe to say that going into 2006, no one had expectations from Italy. I mean, sure, they had a lot of great players, but there was so much scandal that there was not a chance people thought that they were going to be doing anything, and they did. It's the same now. I mean, sure, people do have expectations from them because they've been on the upswing. But Italian football, as as such, does have a little bit of a past when it comes to. Speaking after some major tragedy, and I think the major tragedy this time, unfortunately, was with their national team not being able to make it to international tournaments. Where you think Italy, of all people, have a birthright in certain issue history in class of that team, and so it would be very hard to look past them. And I, for one, am very excited to see how they do. Indeed, indeed, Italy. 60 years later, they failed to qualify in 2018, but this time they'll be even more determined, considering Italy, four-time World Cup winners. They last won the Euro 50 years back. It confounds me that the class and the pedigree that Italian football produces. How come they've just managed one Euro win in the last 50 years? It it is totally baffling. But I hope in 2021 the Azzurri strike with a vengeance. Because admit it, folks, blue has a definite edge for us Indians. We like the Azzurri. We like French. England, yes, we do the three lions bit because of their past. But yes. Italy should do well, and let's hope that a strong Italy adds more flavor to Euro 2020. It's a few hours away, folks. Just a few days away. 
Thank you so much for joining us on the special broadcast of Euro 2020. I am Siddharth Vishwanathan, as always, joined by Shane Dias. Click on the bell icon, tap on the subscribe icon. You will get more videos from Euro 2020 when they come. We are getting into it, folks. It's action station. Action stage left. Thank you, guys. Stay safe.